Welcome to Salon Talks. I am Mary Elizabeth Williams, and this is producer, writer, actor, director, entrepreneur, man <laughs> of many, many talents, Sean Levy. You know him from generation-defining tentpoles like the Night at the Museum movies, which defined my kids' entire childhoods. <laughs> Things like Stranger Things, Free Guy, The Adam Project. He is going to be directing the new Deadpool movie at, at some point, yes. and the new Star War, a new Star Wars movie at some point. But now, first and foremost, right in front of us, is the long-anticipated, absolutely beautiful Netflix adaptation of the Pulitzer-winning all the light we can see. We cannot see. Hi. Oh, Hi. Sorry, we can't see. I that, can see I, all the light. I'm, I'm flattered um, and out of breath from the intro. <laughs> Me I, too. It, you make it sound like I'm very busy. You are. I feel like I should be more stressed right now. You should be. <laughs> I have been doing a lot of research on you, and if I were, if I had all the balls in the air that you do, I would, I would not be as calm as you are. Let's start with all the light we cannot see. This was a passion project for yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, you read the book as well. I know, and um, I read the book as a reader. I didn't read it looking for a film or television show that might be made out of it. I read it. By the time I came back to work, having read it on some New Year vacation, uh, I was crestfallen to find out that the rights were already unavailable and that people were trying to adapt it into a feature film. And so I kind of licked my disappointment wounds and instructed everyone that I work with. I have a production company called 21 Laps. I said, let's just keep our ear to the ground. And sure enough, several years later, maybe three years later, we heard that they had been unable to basically condense this epic sweeping story into a two hour movie and the rights were reverting to the novelist Anthony Doerr. And so my producing partner, uh, Dan Levine, and I got on the phone with Tony and basically started with the pitch that let's not try to shrink the story, let's do justice to the story. Um, and let's use the limited series as a form that is effectively long form cinematic storytelling. Uh, and so that was, that was the beginning of this process and, and, and we were off to the races. And um, in that adapting it and being true to it is the casting. Mm. This casting, that central character of Marie, the two actresses that you cast for it, especially the older Marie, was really centrally important. Yeah. It's centrally important to the story and it was important to the production that you get the right person. Tell me about the, the search for her. Yeah, well, I decided in pre-production that if it were possible, to find someone who was low vision or legally blind to play a character who is blind, that it would not only be the right thing to do, but be the better thing to do, better by virtue of being more authentic. Um, and so we put out a global casting search because the truth is that finding a girl and a young woman who are blind, who are represented by acting agents, there's very, very few. And so we needed to just reach people wherever they were. And we got hundreds of auditions, people who had filmed things on their cell phones or had a relative do so. And in the midst of these hundreds of auditions, I came across this one by this young woman named Aria Mia Liberti, who was a Fulbright scholar, was a PhD candidate in rhetoric, who had not only never acted before, had never auditioned before, but there was something fierce and intelligent and uh, luminous about her that multiple callbacks and conversations revealed to be powerful. And so even though she literally at that point did not know what she was doing, having never acted before, I saw, or at least I bet on the fact that she had the innate tools that I could work with. And, uh, and indeed, she was the bet that paid off. It's a stunning performance, and knowing that it's a, a debut performance makes it all the more, yeah. and knowing that it is, it is not someone who is acting being blind. That that well, is. and it's interesting watching the show. I've had some people say, you know, it took me a while to, to even understand or believe that she was blind. And, and that, I think part of that is because for a hundred years of cinema, right, and, and X number of decades of television, we have always seen blindness represented um, by sighted actors who use a, a certain kind of toolkit of tropes, right? The way they feel their environments, the way they feel other people's faces, many of which are just wrong. And so every day, Aria and I would talk about the scene and she would educate me. She would 
uh, frankly, illuminate, pun intended for me, uh, the cliches of representation. And I was pretty committed to going against those, resisting them, rejecting them, I guess is a better word. And so the result is a performance that is indeed the real thing. And that's just one element of it. You are, you know, when you were working on an adaptation of something that is as loved, mm. won a Pulitzer Prize, international bestseller, there's gotta be a different kind of, I don't wanna say nerves, but a certain sensitivity to that material working with the writers, working with the actors, how did you come together to create this singular vision, knowing that of course it's going to diverge, of course it's also going to be different, and it's not going to necessarily be the book that everybody carries in their heads? Well, the truth is nothing can, nothing can manifest what's in our heads because the book in your head is different than the book in my head. So recognizing that, um, frankly, I'm immensely lucky that Anthony Doerr, the novelist, from the get-go said to myself and to Stephen Knight, the writer who wrote all of the episodes, who, his background is Peaky Blinders, the show C, um, but Tony said, guys, I recognize this is a different format. So I'm going to trust you in navigating and adapting to your format because I created this in mine. And so um, a lot of it was trusting our own instincts as fans of the book to not mess with the stuff that to me felt sacrosanct. Those include, you know, major traits like the themes, which we can talk about if you want, the father-daughter story, the kind of cross-cutting of a German young boy and a French young girl, um, the model of the town that Daniel makes for his daughter, the fact that these two characters are destined to meet, if only to spend an hour together eating a can of peaches towards the end of the war. So some of it was untouchable. Um, some of it felt like there was a way to dramatize the story in a way that would be different um, from the novel. And hopefully where we have diverged um, is successful and, and all feeds towards the most important thing, which is the the epic sweep of the story, but also the intimacy of the storytelling. And that is a recurring motif that I see in everything that you do. You know, you are kind of known as this family friendly, yeah. light and bouncy kind of a director, and yet I always see so much depth and so much heart and humanity in, in the work that you do. I read an interview that you did 10 years ago, almost 10 years ago, where you said, everything comes back to family for me. Why is that? Why is that the key component? And it is in every, you did this with before uh, Stranger Things. Well, you do said you know that. what's so interesting? I, I, had never, I had never connected the dots across my films and shows. Um, it was before, it was oddly Darren Aronofsky who uh, said to me at some event, he's like, so what's with you and, and dads and, and, and forgiveness of fathers and connections in family. And I was like, what are you talking about, man? I make movies about museums coming to life and robots punching each other. And, but it was Darren who pointed out that there's certain themes I do keep returning to and it made me more conscious of it. And I guess um, certainly it's become maybe even more overt in my later work, um, certainly Adam Project, certainly All the Light We Cannot See, where you know, my own childhood, I grew up in Montreal, my parents were divorced, by the time I was three, my mom struggled with alcoholism and depression. And so family was fraught. And I wanted to build in my adult life a family that was solid and enriching. And I wanted to create work that maybe put out an aspirational uh, theme about what family can be and how redemptive those connections can be. And so, uh, so it's not always based in our experience where we create from. It's sometimes based in what we dream of being uh, that informs our creative work. And I guess for me, it was largely the latter. And it's, uh, you know, particularly watching this, um, all the light we cannot see, it is so different because it is so cinematic. I'm curious about who you used as maybe touch points or references mm. who inspired you as a filmmaker. Like I, I see certain directors and I see certain films watching this, but I'm curious what you referenced. Well, the, the, the first one I'll mention is probably the most obvious. Um, certainly I did a rewatch on Private Ryan. Um, I got to know Steven a little bit because he produced my movie Real Steel and so his work has always been inspiring. 
Uh, but frankly, so has the work of Peter Weir, uh, who did Dead Poets and Gallipoli and Fearless and uh, Master and Commander. I, I really, I've always known that I'm never gonna be one of these filmmakers whose work has a signature aesthetic. I'm not Wes Anderson. I'm not Baz Luhrmann, right? Certain directors, their movies always look like their movies. I take my aesthetics and my style from the tone of the story. So Free Guy is poppy and primary and video game inspired. Whereas All the Light We Cannot See is frankly more inspired by photography of the 30s and 40s, the way that light has a certain softness to it, the way that certainly in the history of French design and French aesthetics, you see a collision of pattern and color, but all with the patina of age, of a, of a, of a history. And so my production designer, Simon Elliott, and my, my cinematographer, Tobias Schlichler, um, one of whom is British, the other of whom is German, we really looked at um, the aesthetics of the time more than we looked at films representing that time. And so, I don't know, what I love about the job is that every story requires different stimuli. You take your inspiration from different places. And so, on All the Light, to find an aesthetic that was more lyrical uh, and often more muted, more with that patina of history, that was, that was very inspiring to me. And working on things like, I, I want to come back to Stranger Things because you, you're working with, there are different directors, there mm -hmm. are different, there's a, there's a consistency of tone, but then everyone has their own stamp on it. The episode, Dear Billy, was this <laughs> watershed, I mean, it was a watershed I appreciate that. I, I just told a friend, I'm like, you know, people ask me what was my favorite movie, what's the movie you're going to be remembered for? Guess what? Up there is Dear Billy. That's a one hour episode of TV, but... Indeed, it became not only culturally so um, sticky, but it was so creatively inspiring. It, but again, I read the Duffer Brothers script and it told me what it wanted to be. It told me it wanted to be epic and it wanted to have imagery that felt iconic. And, uh, and so I just, I try to read the words. Sometimes I write the words, sometimes I rewrite the words, but the words tell me the visuals. And the Duffers, one of their many genius traits is their screenwriting is so clear to me in its visual suggestions. It's epic, it's iconic, it has one of the biggest needle drops <laughs> in, in pop culture history with Running Up That Hill, but it's also this very small interior story about grief. Mm. And I think that's a big part of what hits so hard. That's really interesting because we, when, when I think back to Dear Billy, the two scenes that were clearly going to be the pillars of that episode. Yes, it's Max in the mindscape and then running away from Vecna towards a vision of her friends. But it's also that monologue at Billy's grave. That monologue we knew for months, and again, it was, it was deferred. The filming was deferred because the pandemic shut us down. But I always knew that one couldn't land without the other her desperation to get out of the mindscape is as powerful as it is because of the grief and the self-loathing that that graveside monologue expresses. And so um, it's all, you know, for, for finale movements, for climax in storytelling to work, the building blocks along the way need to work. And so in All the Light We Cannot See, for instance, the father-daughter love story in episode one is necessary to pay off the, the hope that Marie clings to for her father's return. So, so all of the storytelling building blocks, they're, they're critical to the payoff. And also in that, in that episode of, of Stranger Things, so much of it hinges on that beautiful performance by, by Sadie Sink. You've also worked with her <laughs> under the direction of Taylor Swift. I want to ask about what it was like working with Taylor Swift, because like you, she is someone who has a lot of different plates spinning, who is not just known for one thing, who is not just one kind of artist. You are not just one kind of artist. When you're working with someone like a Taylor Swift, or you're working with someone who has all this kind of multidisciplinary career, what do you learn from how they do it and watching how they're balancing it all? Yeah, well, well, that's uh, well observed. And, and Taylor is 
so multifaceted in her creativity. And I find that she's, she's one in a long line of collaborators. Uh, and my cameo in the All Too Well video, um, it would be an overstatement to call it a collaboration. I showed up and did what Taylor Swift told me. So very simple gig. Uh, but if you look at my films, I constantly collaborate with people who are more than one thing. Started early on two movies with Steve Martin, writer, performer. Three movies with Ben Stiller, writer, producer, director, performer. Then two movies with Tina Fey, writer, producer, performer. Uh, and most recently, Ryan Reynolds, writer, producer, performer. I guess I like people who are creatively voracious. And that tends to mean you're not gonna only do one genre. You're not gonna tell only one kind of story. And you might not only do one kind of creative endeavor. Uh, and that's always been my aspiration. It's how I've ended up becoming as much of a producer as I'm a director, and certainly on the last Deadpool movie, being one of the writers with Ryan. Uh, it's all scratching itches that never go away. And those itches are, um, I guess, just a yearning for creative experiences that feel new and challenging. Yeah, I wanna ask you one last thing, which is about Ryan Reynolds and about Deadpool. You have worked with, this is now your third collaboration with Ryan Reynolds. Everything is now kind of shut down. The impact of that on hundreds of people who you work with, how are you and he and everyone else involved in Deadpool dealing with this unique challenge? Yeah, well, I, I wanna start by saying, you know, Ryan and I are fortunate in that our careers have given us, uh, I mean, we're losing our minds creatively stifled, but we're not losing our homes. We're not needing, as some of our crew members on Deadpool and Stranger Things have had to do, uh, to become Uber drivers or food delivery um, drivers. The impact of this strike is brutal, and it's brutal not just on the guild members who are on strike, but the ecosystem of our industry, uh, many of whom don't have a fallback gig. And so as the weeks and now months have dragged on, uh, the, the, boy, the fallout is really upsetting, really painful to a lot of families. And I'm so hopeful that even, I pray still because I'm an inherent optimist, that by the time people watch our conversation, uh, that we will have come to a fair and equitable resolution to this strike and that uh, our industry, certainly the Deadpool 3 is back to filming because we paused halfway through, but that our industry at large is back to work. I, well, from your lips to yeah. the industry's ear. But in the meantime, we can watch all the light we cannot see on Netflix. It is absolutely a beautiful, Thank beautiful, you. transformative and very relevant well, you know, I, I didn't know if we were going to talk about that. And I feel like we're going for the wrap up. But I, I just, I do want to add, I, the show's a work of fiction. Um, it's based on a beloved book set in World War II. But boy, these themes, these themes of somehow in the midst of dark times, and we find ourselves living yet again in truly dark times, in the midst of that darkness to somehow tenaciously believe in the light that we cannot see, I, I know we're all praying for that light right now. Absolutely. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for having me.